The FBI tried to hire me. Yeah, when I came back, me being 19 or 20, no matter how young I was, hungry, tired, I knew death before dishonor. Well, some people they ask the question, why do state troopers have shaven heads? They're different, different <laughs> methods on why they, right. they're all shaven. When he finished his career, he was like, he's happy with it because he felt like he couldn't do nothing more than what he did mm. of how hard he worked mm -hmm, and everything. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the, how hard you have to work, of being the fact that you don't have haters. You know, ninth, 10th, it, it was none of that. So uh, navy blue or white? But did they like you though? Did the girls like you in school? Oh man, I can't, I can't say that in the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Don't think about telling the authorities, and don't think about going to your Muslim brothers, because all of them work for us anyway. They're all on the payroll. Splitter, hundred and welcome back to another episode of Worldly Life Podcast. I got my guest another than Mufti Ibn Munir. For those of you who don't know. This man studied in Medina for over ten years. He 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 was a he was a he was a young courageous young youngin who was hungry for knowledge. He was seeking he was seeking his um his um his ambition. He was ambitious. He was seeking his um chasing dreams. Chasing his dream. That's what I was looking for. But then I go what's the name? But don't worry and everything. We got none of that. He inspired me. Inspired many people. Um, alhamdulillah. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be next to this brother right here, so I'm a little nervous, but I'm alhamdulillah. But we we got our brother here. Jazakallah Thanks for Thank you Thanks for the invitation. Yes, yes, I appreciate for sure. It. I appreciate Definitely. it. Definitely. May Allah bless you. Yes. So, so talk to us. I wanna I wanna attack this from a different angle. You from Philly? Mm -hmm. I'm from the Bronx. So we both from the hood. So obviously. What one of the things that gravitated me towards listening to you is because growing up, I'm we listening to all type of speakers. Like they all foreigners, though. I never seen a speaker that was young, that was um, that was very sharp, like yourself. And everybody's just looking back, but they don't know the hard work that this man put in and got to the level where he's at today, business and life. So. I wanted you to talk, talk talk to us about the little, the grind that took you to get to where you at right now. I understood. Coming understood. from the hood, coming from where we come from. For sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. Well, I mean, you brought up a very good point with regards to coming from the hood, the urban, the grit, the inner city, with all of the different challenges, the problems, uh, and the horrors that uh, people who grow up in the hood face. Yes. And it's either going to make you or break you. Right. We know that. Definitely. You know, different people, alhamdulillah, that's doing good. Prosper and healthy well now and the countless other individuals who became statistics no. They became numbers, you know, unfortunately, you know of that of that of you know of the hood and the reality of the hood of You know the inner urban city, you know, what I mean let alone the good and the advantages no. That come from being from the hood right. and living in the urban, you know uh, mental toughness Okay resilience you learn how to how to survive right you know how to appreciate you know And there's countless different blessings that come from being in the hood but, you know, regardless of the blessings and the positivities, we know that there are horrors. Correct. And that many of us don't make it or haven't made it. Facts. Or we make it with, with you know, major baggage or major scars. So that's a discussion in itself. And I, I've spoken on this before um, about the advantages and the disadvantages of coming from Philly. In general, as a city, uh, West Philly, my city, my neighborhood, so on and so forth. So, um, you know, 60th Street, you know what I'm saying? I'm from 61st Street, you know what I mean? So that, that's a discussion in itself. But the grind, the grind ain't over. I'm still grinding as we speak. Mm -hmm. And I feel that the day in which you feel that you don't have to grind, you don't have to work, you've made it, I graduated, I memorized, I made my hivot, you lost already. Right. And right. you know, one of my main uh, parallels that I, I often refer to is sports. Yes. Sports. So I think one of the biggest dangers uh, upon myself, upon all of us, those who are listening and watching, is being defeated by victory. Never allow victory to defeat you. And that may sound like an oxymoron. How can victory defeat you? Yes. But it's a reality. Mm, you can become like drunk. That. You become intoxicated with victory. And then you lose your hunger. Right? You take your foot off the gas pedal. You think, oh, I got it. I made it. I graduated. I finished Medina. Whether it's bachelor's, master's, PhD. You memorize the Quran. You memorize the Quran in a different version. You touch weed, whatever. Your recitation. And you think, you be, and you become lax. And you, you don't have that hunger anymore, and then obviously things start to fall apart. No. So I'm still on the grind now. Yes. 
but a part of my past grind. Of course, there are levels. Yes. You're not gonna. I'm not gonna sit here in front of you and act like okay, everything that I did when I was 18, I'm doing being 39. Certain <laughs> things, you know, you 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 grow and you don't need anymore. Yes. But at the end of the day, when I found out about knowledge, about you know, you know, real knowledge overseas in the prophet city, that was my dream. Uh, and I was a daydreamer and a night dreamer. Yes. I dreamed about it when I was in school. I mentioned this in many, many interviews before. Yes. And uh, Allah had blessed me to realize that you got to work for that dream. Right. And, and one of the things that I had to work for, you had to get a high school diploma. I didn't want to go to high school anymore because I just wanted to go to Medina so bad. You didn't want to go to high school? Once I heard about it. How old were you? How old I was, you? When I heard about Medina, I was about maybe 16 or 17. Between 16 and 17, maybe 17 years old. So when I heard about mm -hmm. it, and I was like, whoa, I can go there for free? I can study Islam? I can, I can learn in the, the prophet city and look like you and, and brr, chop it up with the Arabs and talk like you? But coming from the hood, like you said, yes. from Philly, from West Philly to Medina? I was like, whoa, this is unreal. Right. And he was like, yeah, you can. Right. You, and you should. So that became my dream. And um, you know, I was just so caught up in knowledge and the deen. I had no desire to study that other stuff. Right. I had no desire to be around, you know, those non-Muslims and stuff. And and I just let's keep it real. <laughs> you know, you know, you, you, the girls and everything. I didn't want to be in that environment. I was wearing a dope. Yes. In high school, uh, you know, a duffer dope. Tailored. In high school. Yeah, no doubt. You didn't care ankles. what nobody said. No, no. As long as it matched his uniform, uh, you know, uh, tenth grade and eleventh grade. I think it was eleventh grade. You know, he had to have uh, matching colors. But you know, ninth, tenth, it, it was none of that. So, uh, navy blue or white? What did they like you, though? Did the girls like you in school? <laughs> oh, man, I can't, I can't say that in the <laughs> podcast. You know what I'm saying? It is what it is. You know, but, We need to know the gritty, but like, what all, you went all through. All jokes aside, mm -hmm. I mean, some people, let's just be honest, it was many people in like my different classes, <laughs> they would come to you even more. Yes. Certain females will like try to come to like, oh, you know, like, yes. like, no, you can't touch me back up. Right. And, you know, so what's, what's this? Like, ah, ah, you can ask, but you can't touch. <laughs> right. So, you know, I had I had girls in my class ask me, who hangs your clothes at night? Yes. Why, you know, I say it used to be crispy. Right. So they'd be like, you know, who hangs who, who your stuff? You mm. know what I mean? Or, or what is that? Or what you wearing under that? It's reality. Yes. So the shaitan, you know, he, he'll come for you. No don't matter get, what, yeah, no yeah, matter what. That's right. Don't get yes. it twisted. So that's a part of the grind. Just avoiding that. Mm -hmm. But like, you gotta study. If you want to go to Medina, you want to go overseas, you gotta get your high school diploma. There is no way around that. If it's an official university that requires uh, a high school degree, okay. so that, that was that was first and foremost. Then studying. Yes. All right. Okay. Memorizing, learning Arabic. In the beginning, I taught myself Arabic. I didn't have a teacher in the beginning. So you learned Arabic before you even went yes, to go study. Yes, yes, And I, I mentioned this many times. The brothers, like, like you said, grind and grit. It's just that simple. Two G's: grinding and, and grit. Right. You know, it's not about comfort and, and ease and relaxation. So when I when I was eighteen, I, I graduated high school. Uh, you know, I got the degree. That's all I needed. I had the money to go. Alhamdulillah, I could speak Arabic. I it wasn't the best. Yes. I'm still learning Arabic and practicing to this very day. But I could actually, you know, talk and understand fluently. So did you have to take the Medina course or whatever? No, or you, alhamdulillah, I did You went straight into the... Yeah, yeah. But when 2002, I wasn't in school. That was yeah. also for my hunger. I was just I was just there freelance. I, I made Umrah and I stayed for Fun a year. Man. Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Off I my own that. money, a place to stay, whatever the case may be. Then I left. Uh, then I went back to make Umrah a second time to apply a second time. Then that's when I went to Yemen for a year. Then I came back before I got accepted. So I didn't get accepted to Medina like maybe what, 2005? Yeah. So for those who don't know what's Umrah, you can. Well, Umrah is the 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 partner of Hajj, the twin of Hajj, the, yes. the little brother of Hajj. Okay. Umrah can be made um, any time out of the year. Yes. Hajj obviously it was done in those specific months. Yes. Hajj ashurul ma'lumat. No. Okay. But Umrah can be made basically any time of the year, and it can be done in one day. Okay. You want to make your toe off. You're going to make your sa'i, you're going to shave your head, all right, along with the other recommended things in between that. And Umrah, uh, many scholars consider Umrah to be obligatory. Yes. And if it isn't obligatory, for sure, it's a great act of worship. No. And obviously, that was my way of getting into Saudi Arabia. Yes. So, Umrah visa, perform the worship, go to Mecca, Nashad al-Haram, and I'll never forget seeing a Kaaba for the first time in my life. It was it's unbelievable. There's no so, other feeling. Yeah, it's unbelievable. No. And, you know, it ain't hit me at first. It's like It was like surreal. But like a couple of days afterwards, man, it was awesome time. 
we just we came back from the bookstore. Me and the older brother I was with, Sheikh Yusuf, may Allah bless him. Yes. And um, they called you then, man. I just burst in tears. It's like, whoa, like you know, do you realize where you are? And like yes. you said, coming from West Philly. Yes. How many people was dead, shot, in jail, caught yes. up chasing girls, girls right. chasing them, caught up, you know, chasing dunya, this degree, that degree, you know, the worldly stuff. And here you are in front of the Kaaba. You came from that environment. So you it, it like was just stuff. unreal. So mm -hmm. uh, going to high school was a struggle with regards to avoiding, you know, becoming a statistic. Drugs, murder. You know, I had people in my school. In West Philly, I, like I said before, it's not even the worst part of Philly. You got parts of Philly that's far more notorious. Wow. But for sure, I know I had plenty of people I went to school with that got killed, shot in the street. Muslim and not Muslim. Wow. You know, I could give you different things. You can, like, Google, like... You know, Google the Lex, Lex Street Massacre, L-E-X, Lex, Lex Street Massacre, and then why they call it a massacre. If you Google how many people got shot and killed that night, I went to school with all of them. And the main person that got killed in that massacre was somebody that I used to battle with. We used to, we used to rap battle. I was just about school. to ask you that. Yeah, like, it, they don't know that. Like, Yeah. So that that's the story. You used itself. to rap. Yeah. Honorable. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was in the ninth grade. He was older than me. Right. And I had I had to learn his name was George. Yes. That was his name, right? He got he got killed that night. Yes. And uh, it don't you know it didn't take me long to figure out that he was like he was he was that dude the whole okay. the whole entire high school. Yes. He was the, the toughest of this to that. He dressed you know what I'm saying he was the flyest dude. Yes. All the girls you know what I'm saying all the dudes either respected him without fearing him or fearing him. Okay. So what happened was you know I, I used to see how he used to dress every day. You right. know what I'm saying fresh Tim's. This is back in the day, you know, guest yeah. jeans, <laughs> pin pocket. You remember right. that? Yeah. It's not, you know, way before the skinny, you know, definitely. Kooji sweaters. And That's polo. in the 90s. Yeah, crazy. That was, 90s, he, yeah. that was every day he's dressed like that. Right. And I used to look at how people would look at him or not look at him. Yes. And, and the girls and everything. So I figured out, all right, you know, he was a real arrogant, cocky type of guy. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, that, that's him. Yes. And it don't make no sense for me to what? <laughs> Unnecessarily clash with him. Right. That's just common sense. Yes. And then I heard people talking. I realized that he would fail. He would continue to fail. He was been supposed to have graduated, but he was like the kingpin of, of the school of West Philly. Yes. So he stayed in school strategically for Purpose. operation. Yes. So one day we in the lunchroom. It's me and my friend, right. Frank. Uh, and uh, you know this was before Thobes. I was Muslim. I always was Muslim. Yes. But this was before I like you know was enlightened. Yes. And I heard about Medina and everything. So we in school, you know, and uh, Frank used to rap and I used to rap. And we just minding our business as freshmen. Yes. Right. You know, we wet behind the air, you know, straight out of middle school. <laughs> right. So next thing you know, as we rapping, the seniors and the juniors, they're it's like, whoa, who them over there? Right. Literally. So they got win. Yeah. So they came over to our tent. We like, whoa, whoa, we don't <laughs> want no problems. <laughs> so they're like, no, you good, keep rapping. So we going back and forth, so on and so forth. So before you know it, it was nothing but a little a short period of time before George felt a little insecure. Right. I can't say jealous I was that good, but he felt like- Your right, bars made him insecure. Yeah, like, all right, this young guy may be a problem. Yeah. So he tried to challenge me mm -hmm. in the lunchroom. So I'm like, no, I'm good. He said, no, you know, it's don't worry, you good. So we went back and forth. And FYI, for the record, I'm not bragging or, or glorifying <laughs> you, just, you know, talking about the struggle. Right. You know, I, I, I beat him. I trashed him. <laughs> you know, I you killed him. He had a crazy punchline. I can't. I can't say right now. Any bars? Can you say I can't. any bars? I can't. You remember? So you actually I, remember a that a little bit? Just we're gonna we're gonna say that for now. All What's right, important but. is I, I I won the battle. Right. So everybody was like, "Oh snaps!" The girls is looking, and George he he ain't take it like that. Yes. You know, like oh, I'm a, I'm a you know, it was like like respect. Right. You got it. Mm -hmm. That was it. Okay. And ever since then, he looked at me differently, and he respected me differently. And then as I started getting more religious and learning, wearing the fold, ninth grade, the 10th grade, so on and so forth, he respected me even more. Mm. And I gave him dollar. That's how I love Yeah, and I remember one time we was in the hallway, and uh, he said, man, he said, yeah, man, I wouldn't mind being a Muslim. I want to be a Muslim, but, you know, if I come in a mosque dressed like this, is it a problem? Yes. And he had an iced out, you know, you know, Jesus piece, as yes. they say, you know, what I mean? like, you know, like, you know, it's in high school. Yes. So he like, you look like he in a video this is in high school. You just imagine, you know, so so one brother said and this brother got killed. Yes. He got shot in Southwest. He said, yeah, he said, is somebody going to snatch off your chest? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, what? He said, ain't nobody going to snatch my chain. And then shortly afterwards, he got he got shot in that in, oh. a, in, in a drug house. 
Subhanallah. Right? In a, a section of Philly, Philly we call it Down Bottom. Right. Mantua. You can read about it. It's not a story. Read up the Lex Street Massacre. Yes. Right? And you, you knew most it. of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I used to rap with them. I knew them. Yeah. They was older than me. And they all got killed. And one night, somebody set them up in a, in a, in a crack house. They God. all got shot. The execution style. So the moral of the story is, Muslim and non-Muslims got killed, got caught up in the system. And here I am in Mecca. So the message is, you know, whatever you're going through, whatever you've been through in your life, you know, never underestimate Allah's mercy or Allah's blessings no. upon you. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And, and appreciate what you have. And a lot of people, they don't know that it, it ain't sweet. Facts. We ain't, we weren't, it was no silver spoon we were born with. You know, you had to, you had to come out of that stuff. Facts. You know, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. True story. That's, that's all, interesting. all of that is, is all facts. Thank you. None you gave it to me. No holes bars. No, 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 no. no. Uncut. Raw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight to y'all. Live. So, um, you was talking about working hard. And you like to use basketball as an analogy. So, somebody that comes to mind... Because, you know, I come from a basketball background. I played basketball. I played what position? high school. I played. I was a small forward, small center, forward. power gotcha. forward. Gotcha. gotcha. Those gotcha. was my positions. Because gotcha. I was skillful, so I could, I could oh, play. Oh, you could. Yes, yeah, so I, I could play I all see, of those. I see. Got you. So, some, somebody that we know that many players um, recognize as a great is Kobe Bryant. And he's somebody that worked very hard. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's... <clears throat> It was it was recognized by his peers of how hard he worked, and he got heavy praise for it. Yeah. And I wanted you to talk about, and obviously he's one of the greatest of all time. You can't mention goat without mentioning uh, mention goat. Kobe uh, in that can conversation. Can you explain the term goat with some of the rulers, some of the viewers? <laughs> greatest of all time. Greatest. It's an acronym. G O A T. The goat. Yes. Right, keep Please. Going. <laughs> There's no other strict stuff y'all talking about, whatever. But greatest of all time. But he put in that time, that work. And people hated him for it. Mm -hmm. How he was, he was like people because of his passion for the game. Some people didn't like playing when he was a tough teammate and everything. But when he finished his career, he was like he's happy with it because he felt like he couldn't do nothing more than what he did mm -hmm. of how hard he worked mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the how hard you have to work, of being the fact that you gonna have haters, you gonna have people trying to compete with you. He, he was very competitive as well. Mm -hmm. How is it in that light of seeking knowledge? Is it com competitiveness? Understood. People try to challenge you. Clear, clear. Well, jealousy and everything. You're absolutely right. We, we make many parallels, metaphors, analogies between seeking knowledge, giving dollars in sports. Mm -hmm. Football, basketball, so on and so forth. That's a fact. Right. And of course, Philly, like many other cities in the United States, is a big sports city. Yes. Like, you know, sports city, extremely competitive. Yes. You know, if you ain't into basketball, no problem. Football, Eagles. Yes. You ain't in the football, you, hockey, Flyers. Right. If you ain't in the hockey, you got baseball. Mm -hmm. If you ain't in the you got boxing. So Philly okay. has always been a sports town. Yes. So we were bred, raised up in that culture and in that okay. environment. All right. And subhanAllah, a good friend of mine, dear friend of mine, may Allah have mercy upon his soul. Uh, my coach, you know, he passed away. Mm -hmm. Alam a very dear friend of mine. He was, you know, not my basketball coach, but my life coach. Yes. Brother Salah Hadeen, may Allah have mercy on him and be pleased with his soul. I mean. He would always tell me different stories when he was, you know, he was the N1 coach. Yes. So he wasn't in the, you know, the, the pro hop, high, highest level, but he wasn't at, you know, yes. lowest level. So you tell me his different experiences. And that's one of the reasons why we met and we, we mesh so well. Gotcha. We talk about Kobe Bryant. Yes. How he would have everybody traveling with him on the off season. Yes. His trainer, his nutritionist. Yes. It ain't no vacation day. Right. It ain't no day off <laughs> in which you relax and get fat and have a drink on the beach. Like you said, grind, grit. Going to different countries, to the mountains, high altitudes, high elevations, thin air. You're way above the sea level, so you're working 10 times harder. Yes. So if there's a little bit of air up here, imagine when you get inside of the basketball, you know, the arena, how, how your breath control going to be. Yes. So there lies no doubt Kobe Bryant and others from those basketball greats. I mean, it's so many different parallels. And I say this all the time to young brothers, man. If you're going to play sports, your kids play sports, your kids worship sports, at least benefit something from the sport. Yes. How are you going to be lazy at home doing nothing all day, but you're watching someone who's working there behind all? Yes. So I agree with you absolutely, totally, 110% on that. Competition. And very interesting fact, you all know that Kobe Bryant, one of the people that was responsible for making him more dedicated, word you used, 
But there's another word he used in an interview. He says obsessed yes. with basketball with somebody that was from Philly, who played for Philly. Yes. Not originally from Philly. <coughs> okay. And that's AI. Yeah. All right. One of my favorite players okay. of all time. All right. right. No yeah, doubt. So sure. I remember when they was in the finals. Okay. And when they won that first game, Philly was going bananas, yes. nuts, crazy. Yes. Right? And then obviously they lost after that. Mm -hmm. But Kobe respected AI. And he said that AI was one of the people that forced me to become more obsessed with basketball. Facts. And take his, his work ethic to the what? To the next level. To the next level on top of being it. All right. So that's first and foremost. So you got to work hard. Quran, Hadith, Arabic, studying. You got to work hard. Okay. All right. And, 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 and not only do you, you know, work hard, but you got to work, period. Yes. And, you know, what did Vince Lombardi say? Football great. He said the only place in which uh, success comes before work is the dictionary. Mm. Think about that statement. The only place in which success comes before work it's is in the dictionary. There's no other place in which it's the opposite. Yes. So many people today think you're going to be successful by not working. And they think you're going to be successful by only working a little bit. You got to yes. grind. You got to bust your hump. Yes. That's just, it's just that simple. And many of the pious predecessors, they spoke on this, okay? Knowledge is never obtained through relaxation. Yes. Chilling and this, they don't mix. Right. Water and oil, they do not mix. It's Correct. the well and the desert. Mm -hmm. The well and the desert just don't come together. Yes. So you got to work hard. As far as is there competition in knowledge, haters, detractors, no question. Yes. The Prophet Sallallahu he tells us about envy in so many different hadiths yes. and the danger of envy, the Quran. Yes. Uh, Allah tells about the previous nations and how they envied the uh, other nations and envied the prophets. Yes. Okay, so so envy is is a human, it's, it's something that's staple in every human being. Right. Some people have a little bit, some people have a lot. Some people manage it well, some yes. people don't. It's like perspiration. Some no. people sweat a lot, some people don't sweat that much. Okay. Some people know how to wash up, use deodorant, no. you know, control their, you know, and some people don't manage, they don't manage, sweat well. Okay. And then when people do perspire, some people smell is more offensive than yes. than oh. others mm -hmm. but everybody has what the glands the smell, yeah you get what i'm trying to say so that's envy it's a natural thing <clears throat> so how you manage it how you maintain it that's a different story so in knowledge there are going to be people who are going to be jealous of your natural talent yes nothing to do with your work ethic you taller than me in basketball i'm envious you're naturally smarter than me you just naturally like you said sharper than me you yeah. get it you know you're younger than me so there's going to be envy or we're friends right now we are here yeah but the scout came to, to our game and he said give me a call the college scout gave you the card not me correct envy we mm -hmm. in college the nba scout yes right so it's going to be envy when someone excels and uh I, I have all stories all types of stories about that unfortunately you know not to say i'm some victim or some this poor pious person but it's reality you know envy uh and of course healthy competition Yes. And there's nothing wrong with healthy competition. Us competing for goodness to make a standard, to bring justice to the name of knowledge and hadith, you know, not just for personal glory. And of course, bigger than that is Jannah. Let us compete to go to Jannah. Let us rush to go forth to Jannah. Who can give the charity first? You know, who can help out the weak person first? Who can feed the poor person first? Right. So healthy competition is a good thing. Unhealthy competition, envy is a total different thing. Uh, there's going to be detractors. There are going to be people that's going to hate on you. They're going to make any excuse to, to, to you know, dispraise you, to discredit you. He's really not that good. Oh, he got lucky. Oh, you just know this because such and such. But the beautiful thing about the story is when you come from Philly, right? Yes. And let's keep it real. You, you're, you're black American. Your parents is not from Ghana or, or, or Ivory Coast or Senegal. Yeah. Your parents ain't from Pakistan or Bangladesh. Your parents are from Palestine or Lebanon or Kurdistan or Iraq. But like you say, you're American from the hood. And then when you do excel, you do go far, what excuse you gonna make now? No excuse. Cause, but the people, they're gonna find an excuse. Yeah, that's right. But if I was, uh, if I, my family was from you know Lebanon, they would say, oh, well, you know he's Arab, so. <laughs> If I, you know what I'm saying? If I was from West Africa, they say, well, you know. But now, what, you see what I'm saying? So, p people always hate you for one reason or another. Uh, people will always be detractors, you know, naysayers, doubters. And my philosophy is, you know, let your work speak for you. Let your work speak for you. Okay. You can say this, you can say that. Let the numbers speak. Let the statistics show. Let the rings, what? Yes. <laughs> let the rings show. How many rings you got? No, you sure, see what I'm saying to you? You ain't that good. You cheated. All right. But you saying that you ain't got no, you ain't got no Super Bowls. 
So let, let the stats prove. And most importantly, let the fans, the fans know. The fans know who the GOAT is, yes. you know, in sports. So you don't got to talk. You don't got to, you know, beat your own drum. You don't got to toot your own horn. You don't got to brag and boast. Let your work speak for you. Okay. But of course, in knowledge, the, the, the question, there is envy. There's competition. There are haters. There are naysayers. There are detractors. And all of those things you have to learn how to avoid, how to control, yeah. and how to navigate through those choppy waters. Facts. Interesting. So what do you feel going to Medina University was the toughest trial you had to face as a student seeking knowledge? The, the toughest trial going to Medina, there are many trials on um, being poor. Not yes. having food to eat sometimes, that's a, that's a reality. Right. I remember Thomas Medina, we have money for spring water. For, for spring water? Yeah, you couldn't drink the tap water. I remember times in which we had to boil the tap water and wait for it to cool off the drink. Well, I swear. Not every day, yes. but there was, there, was, there was times. And the heat the first time, right? It's reality. <laughs> so, you know, that's one thing. Sickness, being cold, different things. But like, like a real challenge, even to this day, is implementing the knowledge that you learn. Mm. And, and and realizing that the more you learn, the more pious you're supposed to be. And that you can't be a hypocrite. You know, people look up to you whether you realize it or not. Like like an athlete. Yes. You gotta put forth a good example and you sit from a position of of um you know, you're you you've you're you are you are you are one of the lucky ones as they say, right? you 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 have this 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 blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, right? No. Okay. All right, so this privilege is no. the word I'm looking for. Yes. So, you know, it's scary. You read all of this stuff, you memorize all the stuff, you learn all the stuff, but then you look in the mirror, you know, how much am I implementing? Okay. You know? And you got to be afraid of hypocrisy. Yes. And if you aren't afraid of hypocrisy, then that means you're a hypocrite. If you feel safe from it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So that's one of the challenges, realizing that seeking knowledge isn't a joke, it's not a game, and it comes with serious responsibilities, serious duties. You know, you got people that, that, that are waiting for you, your spiritual guidance. That's heavy. Okay. You know, so that, that that's a challenge to this very day. Yes. When staying it, humble, okay. not to cut you off, staying humble. Mm -hmm. You know, and the scholars of Islam, they've spoken on this, how to stay humble, because it's easier said than done, right? If you got all those rings, the championships, it's hard not to brag. Yes. <clears throat> it's hard, mm -hmm. you know, but you got to humble yourself. Facts. Oh. Interesting. One of the things I wanted to also cover is, obviously, everybody see the live stream. They see you an imam, giving knowledge, and they actually, everybody who watches, like, sometimes hold you to a high esteem. So now, they look at you like you're infallible, like you, you just this angel. One thing I wanted to talk about is, everyone has desires and everything like that. As going, going to seek knowledge and everything like that. I wanted to know, <clears throat> How did you transition into seeking knowledge, also being married at Understood. the same time? Understood. How did you get married? Clear. Yes. Clear. Well, I mean, like you said, the hood, right? Right. The dunya. Yes. Philly, Bronx. The same difference. All the same. You know, wherever you are. Suburbs are, you know, you got desires. And uh, you either want to control those desires. Yes. Be patient. Protect yourself, right. or once again, you're going to fall, statistic. Right. I don't even like to use victim anymore. Statistic. We're just dealing with decimals now. Yes. The majority of young men by this age, no. they already lost. Yes. Sexually. Mentally, physically, they're gone. The average girl by this age is what? It's gone. Yes. So if you don't protect yourself by law's help, if the law doesn't purify you, you're going to go along with what everyone else is doing. And that's... Zina. No. Let alone, I mean, that was in the 90s, our our generation, our right now, and, you know, it's the LGBT, you know, homo, lesbian type know. of vibe. You know, so, you know, either you're going to protect yourself or fall victim. Right. All right. And Dunya is a beast. You know, long, sharp claws, you know, long fangs. And it's going to bite you and it's going to it's gonna sink its, 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 its teeth deep into your, to your flesh if you don't protect yourself from that beast. Mm -hmm. So fasting, getting married. Staying busy, even if it's what something, stay busy. Go play basketball. Let that keep your mind off of the other haram stuff. You know what I'm saying? So um, it, it's it's not a joke. It isn't a game. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's advice is for young men and young women to get married. Yes. Because getting married, it protects your mind, your body, and your soul. It protects your mind from sickness. 
And we all know the effects of, of mental sickness and sexual sickness. You know, a person's mind being sick. Unfortunately, Allah almost And a person's heart being dirty and defiled. No. You know what I'm saying? Let alone your physical body, what Zina will do to your body, making you weak, the different illnesses and the diseases that you'll get. As it states in the hadith, وَلَمْ تَظْهَرِ الْفَاحِشَ تُوْفِقَوْ مِنْ قَطْ إِلَّا بْتُلُوا بِالْأَمْرَاضِ وَالْأَوْجَاءَ عَلَتِي لَمْ تَكُمْ فِي أَسْلَافِهِمْ أَوْ كَمَا جَاءُ بِهَذَا الْمَعْنَى The narration states about uh, people who uh, do certain sins and how to be punished with different unprecedented punishments. And from that, the hadith, it states, وَلَمْ تَظْهَرِ الْفَاحِشَ تُوْفِقَوْ مِنْ قَطْ is that whenever there's fahisha, lewdness, obscenity, this sexual, you know, uh, misbehaving, whenever that's a prevalent in the people, the hadith says, they will be punished, they will be tested with illnesses and sicknesses that never existed in their ancestors. We see it today. We see it Think today about today. venereal disease. Yes. How long has venereal disease or venereal disease been around? But you go back certain years, there's no mention of it. Yes. Let alone of new illnesses, whether it's made on a petri dish <coughs> in a laboratory or not. But the moral of the story is nine out of ten times it's coming from sexual contact. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So if you're not using needles and this and that, it's coming from sex. So it, it, illegal sex in Islam, uh, the fahisha haram, it will destroy your soul. Yes, it will destroy your mind. It will mess your mind up. You can't concentrate. Yes, basketball. How many people don't practice because they're thinking about what? Woman. I've seen friend. people lose scholarships because of that. They, Get kicked out of the university. Can't concentrate because of the yeah. girls, right? That's unfortunate. And of course, as we just explained, is that it will destroy your physical body, causing your flesh to rot. And just think about HIV and AIDS. Just think yes. about it. How it attacks your defense system. That's deep. Hundreds. This illness, that illness, it causes you to get sick. You have these types of bumps and lumps, blah, 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 blah. But AIDS is different. HIV is different. It, it takes down your shield. Mm. So the smallest, simplest thing can tear you to pieces. That, that's, that's, that's amazing if you think about it. Mm. So therefore, you got to protect yourself for student knowledge. Now, how do you maintain seeking knowledge, being poor, studying, being devoted, de dedicated, obsessed, and taking care of a wife? That's a challenge. And of course, we live that challenge. Uh, you know, I got married relatively early. You know what I'm saying? So that, that's a challenge. You have to seek Allah's help. That's first and foremost. No. Second of all, you got to prioritize. Mm -hmm. If you got a pie chart, your ratio, how much of it goes to knowledge, how much of it goes to dunya and your no. wife. And thirdly, you got to make sure that you marry a woman that's on what you on. Yes. If I'm playing basketball, I got my name is in the paper every week. I got scouts coming to my game. The, my girlfriend in high school, she got to be someone who understands my lifestyle. Okay. I'm a basketball player. If you're jealous against basketball, if it takes too much of, me, of your time, if you don't like me coming home sweaty, I got to go in the shower, you need to get a different type of boy, uh, boyfriend. You need a boyfriend who's, who's academic or who plays something else. But basketball is my life. It, basketball is my everything. My dream is to go to college. My dream is to go to the NBA. My dream is to play basketball overseas. If your girlfriend, we're just making an example now. Yes. If she don't understand that and respect that and obey that, then you're at fault for your career going down the drain. So it's no different in seeking knowledge. You got to marry a woman that understands that seeking knowledge is your life. And seeking knowledge, I said this before and I'll say it again, that's your first wife. And if she's not okay with polygamy and polygyny, then you need to get another woman. Yes. Because it's going to be many, many hours, me and these beautiful women is going to yes. spend the time. Thanks. It's going to be many, many hours in which oh, oh, a lot of money I'm going to spend on what? My books. And if you're jealous or insecure, you got to find somebody that don't read as much. So that's the mentality that you got to have. You know, of course, you know, what I say now you know, hindsight, right? Yes. The Prophet told us about him. his hajj. If I knew now what I knew then, right? Hindsight, maturity in life. Yes. You grow, you evolve. You know, experience is the best teacher. I always say it to my kids now. Experience is the best teacher. So you learn things now that we didn't know back then. But I always had that hunger, always. And alhamdulillah, I can brag and I can boast about that. I always had that hunger. And I always knew that if it came down to friend, wife, whatever, and knowledge, Knowledge had to come first. Right. Knowledge had to come first. So that, that's so, first and foremost. Second of all is, or thirdly, is that um, from the beauty of knowledge, giving dawah and teaching classes, is that Allah will provide you with a wife. You'll have people that will come to you 
because you're in the right place at the right time. Not, oh, I'm the man, or I'm this, or I'm that, popular, girls like you, you're cute, you're taught, la, 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 la. Just by you serving the law servants, you teaching the knowledge, Allah will make things possible for you. Allah will bring things your way. So my advice, of course, my personal story, is that if you're trying to get married, and you're a student of knowledge, number one, you got to be able to manage both. And you got to realize that the woman that you marry has to be a woman who has similar goals and interests. She got to be a basketball girlfriend, a basketball wife, like I said, a military wife. Yes. They know right now my husband's in Korea. He's in Germany. He's on his base in Japan. He'll be back in four months. It's that simple. Correct. They're daughters of military women. Mm-hmm. And when he come home, he's going to spend time, blah, 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 the kids. But right now, he's serving his country. And so it's unwise for someone in the military to marry a woman that demands, where you at when you're coming home? I need to see you 24 hours, 25, 8, 25 hours. It's only 24 hours out of the day. How much time you want? But she <laughs> want 25. That's unwise. Right. And the man's at fault. So therefore, that's number one, uh, who you marry. Uh, being married and being a student of knowledge, it can be done if you can multitask. Some of us don't have the ability to multitask. Your, your brain might not be strong enough to handle a woman with her physical, spiritual, and emotional needs and knowledge. But if you can, then do so. And of course, what good is it seeking knowledge if your mind is sick, if your heart is sick, if you, if you, if you, if you twist it sexually, what good is it you seeking knowledge? Yes. So from one aspect, see, uh, getting married should take precedence, protection. No. And from another aspect, seeking knowledge takes precedence because once you do marry, it's going to be responsibilities. You're going to have to pay bills. You're going to have to take care of babies, buy pampers, baby wipes. Yes. How much a box of pampers costs? And then the baby's going to be what? Running through those pampers, a newborn. So somebody got to buy a box of pampers. Mm. So if you find a wife that's willing to be patient with you, she wants to study as well. She loves you and admires you for what you're doing. Miss me that. Right. And if you don't find that right woman, don't play yourself. Go overseas, even if it's a couple of years. Finish the language program. Yes. Finish the college. Put something under your belt. Then you will easily get married. Yeah. And the last thing I will say about this is, or before that, is you can't be scared to get, get married at a young age. Put your trust in the law. And you don't got to be perfect. You learn things as you go along. And I, I, I've mentioned this before, you know, different parents, they tell their children, don't get married. You just want to have sex. Oh, no, you're not. You're irresponsible. Maybe that's the truth. But you want me to have the permissible sex or the haram sex and bring home disease, bring home illegitimate baby, bring home shame, lose my soul. Would you like that? But at the end of the day is, as parents, they, they, they treat their children as if the children are, are required to be perfect. Facts. Well, but you weren't perfect. You aren't perfect right now. How do we live in the same household? You're telling me to be this perfect angel, but look, you're a mom, blah, blah, blah. I talked to uncle. He told me about you, you know, what you used to do back in the 70s. He showed me the pictures. So you weren't perfect. Why am I required to be perfect for trying to do the right thing? So sometimes you can't take the advice of your parents when it comes to protecting yourself. Last but not least is me having, you know, studied in Medina... I got people who like me, who love me, people who hate me, people who love me, you know, in, in the form of hate, whatever the case may be. But nobody can take away from me that I got the degrees from Medina. Right. So the moral of the story is, is once you study, if you put in four years, five years of hardcore study and get married, that will remain with you forever. No. So you get married, you have children, you got to work, you got to pay bills, but at least you what? You got the knowledge under your belt and no one can take that away from you. And that Medina degree, inshallah, that, you know, that degree, Allah Alam, the knowledge on that degree, that, may, that one degree may last you 20, 30, 40 years from the knowledge that you got in Medina. So sometimes you, ha you need to get that out the way. And don't mess yourself up chasing a woman and dropping out of school. And um, being from Philly, when I was there in 2002, I think it was like maybe, I counted, I honestly counted, it was like maybe mm -hmm. 14 brothers that were in Medina University from Philly and on uh, the outline, the outskirts, Chester or whatever the case may be, over 14 brothers. And out of those 14 brothers, I think only like two graduated. And most of them dropped out, mm. left for one reason or another. In most cases, it was because of a woman. 
And it's nothing bad about a woman. It's not we're not we're not trying to be, you know, misogynists and you yes. know, downplay women or chauvinists. But mm -hmm. it's reality. And Allah He tells us, man has been created in weakness. And some of the pious predecessors they would say concerning the weakness, uh They say that a man loses his mind in front of a woman. And if that ain't the truth, the biggest fitna what is the truth? Mm -hmm. And many of the sort of they would say, in al ilma la yadi'u bayna fakhid al marati. No. All right, they would say, excuse me, hopefully no one finds this offensive, you know, chauvinistic or whatever, but it's, you know, they say that knowledge will be lost between a woman's thighs. They would mm. say this knowledge will be lost and squandered between a woman's thighs. So the moral of the story is, is that you got to realize that a good wife behind you is going to make you or break you. You devote it, you dedicate it, you obsessed, inshallah khair. You're weak, you know, you don't have that spine, that backbone. Your wife complain, the kids are hungry, the kids are sick, we need to go back home. She, we, we, you know, she needs this surgery. Abdurrahman needs his braces, the, the braces we can't do it in Medina. Uh, next thing you know, you take a, you know, and next thing you know, that's your Medina opportunity, go on. And Abdurrahman, he could have waited a couple months to get his braces. You could have went to Jeddah or Riyadh. You could have went to a better city and, and, and got the surgery. You didn't have to leave and stop your studies. That's the moral of the story. Nice. Beautiful. The last thing I wanted to ask you before we wrap up was, you know, the Quran is full of stories for benefit. You get, you get benefit from the stories and from the Quran. And, you know, our famous imams of Hadith or Fiqh, they went through a lot of trials. Whether it was government, whether it was, I wanted to know what is some, uh, what is a trial in a, or uh, what's the name that you had to face where it wanted you to compromise your dean. I know everyone Understood. has to go through that. Oh man, oh man. Um, I don't know Just how, one, how raw we can get. <laughs> I would say it's not, you know, I wasn't tempted to be honest with you. Yes. It wasn't a temptation, but it, it, for most, for many people, it would have. Yes. The FBI tried to hire me. Subhanallah. Yeah, when I came back, when I came back from uh, when I came back from Yemen, yes. it was 204 before 205, and you know you're going through the normal, uh, uh, the normal motions in the airport with the border patrol, blah blah blah. I never forget this. I had my family with me, my kids, and I knew it was going to happen from the stories that I heard. Right. You know, and and and, and the fame and the infamy of Yemen. You know, the reputations, you know, people say, I said, oh, we're going to get, get bothered. So when we got to the border, I, I'll never forget this. We landed, and I'm just not offensive to nobody or no race. I'm just telling the story as it is. <laughs> right? This big white dude. Yes. This big, big, brown, like, like Hulk Hogan type <laughs> of white dude with his sleeves rolled up. Right. Pythons. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Tattoos. Blonde white guy, right? Yes. And subhanAllah, really quick, pause the tape. Later on in my, in my travels, dawah and knowledge, I learned the philosophy of the border. And it's no different than a state trooper. Yes. They're trying to intimidate you. Right. So some people, they ask the question, why do state troopers have shaven heads? There are different, different <laughs> methods on why they're right. they all shaven. One of the opinions is that it's meant to intimidate you. Right. And that this person is as unnatural looking as possible. Think about it, bald head versus mm -hmm. hair. So they all have skin heads. Why is this? Why do state troopers have skin heads? Why do they all look the same? Why do the military people look the same in the airport or the train station? The guys with the guns, you always see them what? Beefy and bulky. Is this not the case? You're not gonna find a little, you know, Squidward type of, you know, type of guy. Cause it's it's mental warfare. So when you land at the border, they're trying to intimidate you. Even though it's your country and you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't make it, but they're trying to mentally, I don't, can't say it on camera. You're trying to, you know, your mind. So the white dude, you know what I'm saying? And it's nothing against white people. Yeah. We're not with that, that, that racial, racist crap. Yeah. Excuse me. We're not with that. That's not, that's not a Hadith disciple way. I'm mm -hmm. just telling the story. So, and there are plenty of white Caucasian disciples in the world. Alhamdulillah, our brothers and sisters, for Allah's sake. So we're not in that, that, that trash, yeah. that racial trash. What's important is big Hulk Hogan type of white dude, blind guy, <laughs> tattoos all on his arms. He swipes the passport. He said, ah. Then he swipes again, did it? Hit a little thing. I said, ah, here we go. So he's like, yeah, you, you have to get out of line and go down to the room. So I said, for what? You know, this is, I was young. I was yeah. a little more fiery. Right. I wasn't as, you know, composed yeah. and, you know, matured as I am now, even though now I can still, 
<laughs> you said the wrong thing at the wrong time. <laughs> you might, you know. So at the end of the day, he's like, "You gotta go." I said, "For what?" You know. He's like, "Listen, listen. You gotta get a line. You gotta go. Don't ask me." I said, "All right, whatever." Took my passport, and we just took this long flight coming from Jordan, coming from Yemen. Everybody tired, jet lagged, hungry kids, wife and kids. They gotta sit down there. You gotta wait. So go into the office. I get inside the office, and there's two plain clothes guys. One dude wearing a suit and a tie, and the other dude wearing, you know, uh, uh, you would call it tweed, uh, you know what I'm saying, elbow patch type of blazer, you know, the ID, some, some, some Dockers khakis on, you know, like a regular type of, you know, type of guy, right? right. And then the lady walks me in there, she, she worked with the Border Patrol, all right? Yeah. TSA, whatever, Kate, mm -hmm. she was like Asian Asian lady. Chinese descent or something, mm -hmm. whatever. So she walks me in with my passport. She gives the passport to them. Oh, so the, the guys, they start talking to me. Tell us about your trip. Where were you? How long did you stay? What were you doing? What were you studying? Blah, 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 blah. All right, no problem, no problem, no problem. What kind of Muslim are you? Da, 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 you know. So I start, I answer the questions. And then I, I, you know, this was back then. I was very young. You know what I'm saying? This is what, maybe 20 years ago. Yeah. So I'm like, listen. I don't believe in this stuff. We're not a part of this stuff. We don't practice any terrorism. Da 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 da. da. A little different, you know what I'm saying? So the guy said, "Oh, don't worry about it. Oh, we know. Trust me. It's just you know, you just got selected. Don't even worry about it." So the Asian lady, she put the passports down. She's like, "All right, Mike, such and such stand. Yeah, all right, yeah. Peace." Left, walked out the door. Yeah. Soon as the door closed, people the hypocrisy. He said, "Listen, Muhammad." He said, "That lady, Officer Chin, whatever her name is, huh? She, says, she does not work with us." You don't have to explain anything to her. Her yeah. issue is your name, passport, borders. That's it. You mm -hmm. don't have to say nothing else to her. She says, the reason why you're in the room is that we want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. We want to pick your brain. It's what he said to me. He said, uh, uh, he said a person as smart and devoted to Islam as yourself yes. could do wonders against the war against terrorism. That's what he said to me. Well, I He said, you can work wonders. You can, we would love to have you on our team. You, us picking you, you'll be a dream. Somebody young, black American, not from you know another country, you know the culture, your English isn't no yeah. accent, you speak fluent Arabic, fluent English, you studying, we would love to have you on the payroll. So I said, well, you know, no thank you. He said, well, listen, he said, listen, Think about it. we understand your situation. Yes. And that's when my mind was blown. <laughs> I was young, I didn't know, you know what I knew now, you know. They said, we know your situation. We know that you don't have money. We know that you're not working. We know that you're devoted to your studies. I'm like, whoa, how the heck you know that? You know, and, and it's deep. He's like, he's like basically offering me like, we'll take care of you financially. We will, we will give you what you need and what you want. That's tough. So I, I said, no, thank you. He said, oh, come on, you know. He said, I would love to just pick your brain. Huh? Have you ever heard of this? The USS Cole, the Gulf of Aden, remember that? When, they, when they, they blew up the submarine, you know, whatever, the, the ship, all of that stuff. Yemen, did you go to Aden? So it was deep. But alhamdulillah, back then, me being 19 or 20, no matter how young I was, hungry, tired, I knew death before dishonor. And I knew that there's a rule, whether it's Philly, the mafia is big in Philly back in the day. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Joey Molino, stand for all of those people. You know, the mob wars, right? You know you do not cooperate <laughs> with them boys. You don't lay in bed with them at all, period. Because they have no loyalty, no trust, no honor. And all they're going to do is use you. And the moment you are no longer of a benefit to them, they will discard you. Throw you out, spit you out like a, like a fishbowl. Let alone, is it even permissible in Islam for you to be an FBI informant? Is that permissible? Is that lawful to be spying on Muslims and, and, and feeding the stereotypes and the prejudices mm -hmm. and, and the, all of the, you know, the nonsense? This is after 9-11 now. Right. And that's another part of the story. When I went overseas after 9-11, I was in high school when 9-11 happened. It was crazy. It was crazy. I was on a train full of people, crowded, everybody scared. I was like, what's going on? What happened? I had no idea what happened in Philly. So the moral of the story is, he's like, come on, Muhammad. Like, you know, he said, so he said, do, do you like it? Do you like, do you like coffee? Like, you know what I'm saying? Would you like some coffee? I said, oh, thank you. I said, he said, you like tea? I said, he said, okay, man, you gotta let me take you to Starbucks, man. Let me, you know? <laughs> you know, I said, no, thank you. So they tried, I got my passports, I left. Couple of weeks later, I had a, you know, this was back in the flip phone days, it was a Nokia. I had a friend of mine, brother named Yusuf. He got me a phone. 
in his name. This was the, the next year. I was yes. I was got accepted to Medina and I came back in the summer. Mm -hmm. He got me a flip phone under his name. One day I get a random phone call and his I I don't want to say his name on camera. Okay. The Federale. <laughs> the dude from the airport. Hey Mohammed, how you been? What? So yeah, how's it going? He said, I still owe you the cup of the cup of tea, man. Mm -hmm. You know, you never called me back. You never got with me. I gave you my card. I said, okay, yeah, right. I I'll think about it. And the moral of the story is, how the heck did he get that number? Wow. How did he chase me down? The, the moral of the story is, I talked to the other brothers, and some of them, they did a little more than reject a couple of tea, a cup of tea. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then years later, going through other things in my life, right? I talked to other brothers, and and and, and it was one brother, you know, he totally disrespected him. They would hunt him, chase him down. They said to him, "Don't think about telling the authorities." And don't think about going to your Muslim brothers, because all of them work for us anyway. They're all on the payroll. And of course, know, this, this, I got other stories which I don't want to, you know, I ran my That's why another episode. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> but the moral of the story is, just like that, mm -hmm. if I would have said yes, or took that cup of tea, it would have purchased me. They would have bought me out. And they're not telling you, you can't give dawah. We want you to give dawah. We want you. You can make a Hajj. You make a Hajj no matter every year for free. We're going to pay for your tickets. Who you want to take? And I, I've heard, you know, different things. You want to be Imam of this man shit? We'll make it happen like that. A phone call is done. No, thank you. So, you know, that you know, never sell out. Never sell out. Death before dishonor. No. That's the rule. And we only survive by following the rules. And as a wise man was said, without the rules, he said, never break the rules. He said, this whole thing will crack and crumble. When we stop following the rules. That's and the Muslims are supposed to know that. In mm -hmm. Taqwa. Right? Right. And the law surely knows best. Yes. It's like a lot. I think we're going to end here. We went a little bit over time. But it's like I, I appreciate you. Hopefully everything was good. Yes, for sure.